And now an interview with Charles Kennedy, the leader of the British Liberal Democrat Party. With the British election coming up on May 5th, Jeremy Paxman of BBC Newsnight is conducting interviews with leaders of the major parties all this week. This is about half an hour. Hello, this week I'm going to be interviewing the leaders of the three biggest political parties in Britain. It'll be Tony Blair on Wednesday, Michael Howard on Friday. But tonight, here in the Albert Dock in Liverpool, Charles Kennedy, leader of the Liberal Democrats. He's the only one of the three campaigning with a promise of new taxes, higher income tax for higher earners and a local income tax for everyone. He talks of being the real opposition and claims this election could be a breakthrough. He's also just taken delivery of his first child last week, the exhaustion of which he blames for a less than perfect grasp of detail at the launch of his manifesto. You're talking in the region of 20... 20 the, the, yeah. Charles Kennedy, are you fit to be Prime Minister? Yes, I think so. I think that uh, fitness in politics isn't just about personal well-being, but I think it's fitness in terms of a direct approach with people established over many years, and I hope people feel I have that. But wasn't the most worrying thing for you over last week's huge embarrassment when you didn't have control of the details of a key part of your manifesto that so few people were surprised? I don't know about that. The reaction, quite frankly, out and about in the country subsequently amongst many, many people, including uh, people that you just happen to come across in the street, is, how are you getting on, Charles? Have you managed to catch up in your sleep? Don't worry, the first 18 years are the worst. All these kinds of comments. I think every person who's become a first-time father has probably found they've had to go out and do something work-wise and not been as on top of it as they would have wished. All right, well, let's go through some of the details sure. of your proposed local income tax. Are you being entirely frank with people in suggesting that the only people who are going to be at a disadvantage, should it come in, are the rich? Well, we're saying 25% of people, and this is the Institute of Fiscal Studies that's looked at us, 25% of people are going to contribute more than they do under the council tax. 50% of households will be better off, 25% will be unaffected. Now, that's been very direct because the power to tax and the power to make everybody better off is not a power known to politicians in all of history, and we're not trying to hoodwink people on that. Do you know what the average earnings of a fireman are? The average earnings of a fireman? I, not off the top of my head. I can tell you the average earnings of a typical individual in this uh, country, well, which is in the region of £23,000, £24,000. The average earnings of a fireman are about £24,000. Do you know the average earnings of a nurse? Average earnings of a nurse, I would say, in about the same region. About £20,000. Yeah. Uh, couple, a fireman and a nurse, key workers yeah. in our society. This is 20% of households you're talking about, by the way, not the other 80%, but important. Uh, key workers. Yes, absolutely, essential Net income, workers. the two of them, therefore, average 44,000. Yeah. Living in a band D house, how much worse or better off would they be? You will find that the majority of people under our proposals, individuals, will not be paying much more in the main than £10 extra. But what you've got to do, and this is what we're also being straight sure. about people, is to say what else, apart from the local income tax proposals, do you get with the Liberal Democrat package? And yeah. I hope we can get on to that Those as well. are, of course, other points, but specifically yeah. on the funding of local government. According to calculations done for us by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, yeah. they'd be about £103 worse off. And, of course, people would be significantly worse off, wouldn't they, in many of your target seats? Well, what we're doing here is we're putting forward a proposition of fairness in terms of what you contribute locally. At the moment, everybody knows it is not fair because it's not related to your ability to pay. Now, that's an argument of the principle we've got to win in the course of Absolutely, this election. Absolutely, but you have to be frank with people, don't, don't you? I mean, let's take one of your top target seats, uh, Cardiff Central. Right. Uh, would the nurse and the fireman living there be worse off or better off? Well, as you say, and as we say ourselves in our own figures, they will pay a net uh, increase in their contribution. So they will be worse off. But do you do, know by how much? But, but do remember, please, and you take Cardiff Central as an example of this, an awful lot of students there, an awful lot of students are going to benefit right. by our proposals for scrapping top-up fees and tuition fees. Yes, but the, this couple, a mm. nurse and a fireman, average earnings, Van D House, yes. do you know by how much they will be worse off? Well, 
by definition, a local income tax is precisely that. We've given. Do you the know by how much they'd the be thing. worse off? It will depend on the local circumstances. Well, th actually, yes, they do depend precisely upon local yes. circumstances, and indeed, there's a very helpful calculator on your website which enables you to work out whether you'd be better or worse off. And they would, in fact, be four hundred and twenty-nine pounds worse off. That's enough to take a holiday. Well, I think, again, you have got to pitch this in the overall totality of what you're trying to achieve with a local income tax. If you take pensioners, for example, now we know many of those are being hit the hardest by council tax increases. Six million pensioners are going to be taken out of local taxation altogether. Now, you can say to me, here's one set of financial losers, and you're correct. I can say there's one set of financial gainers. The point and is that, is that these too. are not people rich are people who are going to be no, worse but, off. No, but again, we'll come back, but I hope, to other policies in a moment. The fact of the matter is, however, that if you're setting an upfront agenda with people, you've got to be honest and say, yes, some people gain, some people lose, but is the generality of the policy better than what we've got at the moment? But, and we believe it is. But people don't live in generalities. People live in particular times and particular places. Absolutely. Take that constituency of Cardiff Central. Mm -hmm. Would more people be better off or more people be worse off? You would have to break down the number of you households. You don't know, do you? No, not off the top of my head. You'd have to break, off the, break down the number of households you're talking about. But the kind of couple that you're giving me represent 20% of households. And I wouldn't imagine in Cardiff Central it is but that they much are hardly of wealthy people. There. No, you've made this point, and I'm not saying that they are, which is why we want to help that couple in other ways. If they're having a first child, for example, the woman involved for that first child will receive a much higher level of maternity support, £170 under our proposals, than they do at the moment. If they have elderly parents that they're caring for, there will be a much better, more generous package of measures. And if they've got children whom they want to go to university in Cardiff or elsewhere, they will, of course, not be facing top-up fees and tuition fees. Now, there's but the package, and that's what we invite people to consider. We've looked at your top seven target seats, and in every yeah. one of them, people would be worse off if they were living in a bandy house, that couple, and so, that's no fireman. Inevitably, we're not pretending this. We're saying a quarter okay. of all well, council taxpayers will find themselves paying more. We're not hiding behind yes, that. Yes, but that's so a that's, generality spread across the country. Yes, and that means it's spread across every constituency in the country too. Whether they're top, Equally? Uh, not equally, no. of course not. But whether they're top target seats that for is the whole Democrats point, isn't it? or other uh, less top target seats for the Liberal Democrats. We're not this, framing our policy just on that, because this, that shouldn't be the way political parties go about the national interest. This matters because you would like us to think that you could form a government, and it matters whether you're frank with us yes. when you're seeking our vote to form a government. The only example we've got to go upon is where you have been in government in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And if we look at something like your attitude, for example, to GM foods there. Yes. Well, you promised consultation before any more crops were planted, and then when you got into government, that didn't happen. I don't subscribe to that view, It's a actually. process which you described yourself. There is a difference yes. between what you can say in opposition, and then when the facts are presented to you, you've got to decide administratively when you're holding ministerial office. And you've got legal constraints upon Absolutely. you as a minister as well. Wouldn't it be simpler just to say, we'll say anything to get elected, and do something different afterwards. No, I think that's a great mistake, and I don't want ever to see us going okay. down that route. If you look at the position which you cite, the example you cite of GM crops in Scotland, uh, there is not going to be commercial exploitation, and that, I think, is correct. But there was a legal advice given to the ministers, the Liberal Democrat ministers in the Scottish Executive, as to what the constitutional and legal requirements were upon them, and they adhered to that. Okay. Let's look at something like congestion charging. I think, according to your manifesto, you're in favour of congestion yeah. charging. Why are you against it, then, in Edinburgh and in Bristol? Because in both cases, different sets of circumstances, mm. but in both cases, the scheme, the timing and what was in place, we did not view as a party were the correct schemes to put in place. But your manifesto okay. says you want it extended to cities which have a problem of congestion. Yes, we certainly do. And they don't? And we have, no, they do have problems, but what they don't have are the alternative systems for people to make use of. All the indications show that the public uh, will use public transport if it's reliable, if it's affordable, and if it's safe. There wasn't adequate alternative methods of transportation in both 
both those cities at the time, the groundwork had not been done. Contrast and so, compare, just let me finish the example if I may. Contrast and compare with London, where we supported the principle of congestion charging. And, and now I've, you oppose its extension. And we're not happy with this extension as is currently being So that's being another proposed. example of no, where you say not. one thing let and do finish. another. The reason that we supported the principle in London and we argued it and supported Ken Livingstone in this at a time when Tony Blair was not, remember, was because, as he recognised, and I think he was quite brave about doing it, providing you put in the additional resource for public transport, which so, you did in terms of buses, people will make more use of that alternative. Now, that's the right way to go about things. So, in summary, you support congestion charge, except in those places where there's any danger either being extended or indeed introduced in the first place? No, except in those places where the homework has not been done and the groundwork has Could not been Could you tell us a city in. where you do support it? I think it's up to cities and city representatives Do you have any cities in mind? I, that is a matter for local Liberal Democrats to decide, and it's not a matter for okay. me to dictate from the centre. All right, That's let's what devolve parties about. Uh, let's look at something else then. Um, you want 20% of electricity in this country to come from renewable sources and 50% by the year 2050. Mm -hmm. How many wind farms do you want to build? Well, again, we see potential for wind farms. We actually see greater long-term potential actually for offshore mm. uh, har harnessing of energy. And we look, as any party, any set of representatives should, where wind farm proposals are concerned on the merits of each case. But I well, think we 20 should... 20 per cent from think, renewables by 2010. Yeah. How many wind farms? You can't be prescriptive about how many wind farms, because this will well, have to be... You're prescriptive about being, wanting 20 per cent and then 50 per cent by 2050. Yes, and we've got to get there as a society if we're serious well, about how many wind farms is that you can't sit here and predict what will be the number of individual wind well, you know farm how, many, how much electricity you want to generate yes we do and well, indeed how many wind farms do you require to do it well in fact if you look at wind farm technology as a means of electricity generation you would have to cover a very large tract yes. of mainland Britain to achieve that precisely. wind farms alone uh, precisely. that's why and you've got indeed, to look at other another, things no is, you've is got another, another example where for no, example when they're proposed yeah. in Devon, the Liberal Democrats oppose them. They're pr proposed in Durham, the Liberal Democrats oppose them. I mean, it's another yeah. case of you saying one thing and then doing another. I don't think you will find on any of the kinds of issues that you're perfectly reasonably raising that this political party does any more than any elected political party does, which it has its national policies it aspires to, and then it judges the merits, as indeed planning applications have got to do, which are independent of central government, remember. Do you want a lot of wind farms or not? I think inevitably you will see more wind farms across the country. But I think My also... My question is whether you wanted to see a lot of wind farms. I think there is a desirable form of energy myself, providing uh, you can't it is tell relevant us how many. to the... I can't tell you how many because right. I don't even know how many potential applicants would be in the pipeline in another Can we five move on to another of your uh, contradictions then? Your manifesto for business promises, quote, to let the sun set on regulation. Mm -hmm. You also propose an Equality Act, an Environment Responsibility Act, a yeah. Carbon Tax, an Animal Welfare Act, an Act to ensure manufacturers dispose of difficult to recycle products, Mandatory standards and labels for buildings, machinery, vehicles and appliances to cut energy use. Rigorous schemes of labelling and traceability for GM foods and the implementation of the EU Directive on Corporate Environmental Liability. That is letting the sun set on regulation, is it? Well, I think what you've got to do, and each of that checklist you go through, I think any reasonable person, including any reasonable business person, would acknowledge that those are good practices which good business should be aspiring they to. They may if, well be, but it's not, not letting the sun set on if, regulation, if is it? It's not already, indeed, in many cases, implementing. I don't think you'll find the CBI would disagree with that sentiment that I've just expressed. But when we talk about letting the sunset come down on so much of the red tape and the bureaucracy that's on business. You will find the number of senior business personnel in this country where Europe gets blamed actually turn around and says it's the so-called gold plating that goes on at a Whitehall level where they add to European directives ideas so, and schemes that governments have come forward with and civil servants have promoted over the years. That's where we've got to take a much more hawkish line. So to be clear about this, that uh, list that I just recited to you, that very long list of regulations, that is apparently consonant with the sun setting on regulation. That will have to be implemented in 
dialogue and in mm -hmm. a working relationship but with business. You would consider that the sun setting on regulation, that list? No, I would consider other things in terms of red tape and bureaucracy that are stifling so much of business at the moment to be uh, worthy of the term sun setting on business. Now that's going to be our approach. But Look, we're sitting in a city here in Liverpool, great city, uh, run by Liberal Democrats, and one of the things you hear, every visit I make to this city, you hear business who for years operated under municipal le leadership from Labour saying, thank goodness we've got the Liberal Democrats running the city, it's prospering, you just need to look at the construction what? going on, that's because where Liberal Democrats have Fine. power, we work sensi sensibly with the business community. That is being frank with the electorate, is it? Ask the electorate here. Okay. They will tell you. Let's look at that some of the other policies that you don't draw a great deal of attention to. You're proposing apparently that 16 year olds be able to visit sex shops. Is that a serious policy? Well, 16 year olds at the moment uh, are able to get married. So we do have a rather inconsistent approach uh, to the age of maturity right. in this country. We're not you recommending it as a course of action for 16 year olds, but what we're saying is yes. that at the moment, this country, in terms of the way the laws have evolved over many years, does have a rather inconsistent approach to at what age you are allowed to be considered an adult and what age you're not. Go to pubs at 16? No, we're not proposing that you should be able to purchase alcohol at the age of 16. No, we're not. We would, however, like to see, for example, another area, we'd like to see a lowering of the voting age. I think that people are now mature enough at an earlier age to be able to vote at an earlier age also. Well, talking about voting, you also want prisoners to be able to vote. That's not something that's in our manifesto. That it doesn't is matter whether it's in your manifesto, no, it's, it's your policy. It's a Liberal Democrat policy Thank that you. was passed at uh, uh, an earlier conference okay. in the course of this Parliament. But as so you know... Ian Huntley, uh, Rose West, all those people should have a right to take part in well, our elections. Well, one of the things that if you're serious about penal policy in this country, you've got to be serious about punishment for people who have offended, but you've also got to try... So that's uh, for, a yes, for, is when, it? It is a yes. You've got to try that when people okay. are incarcerated, quite rightly, when they come out, they don't become part of the dismal re-offending rates, and that means trying to make them more responsible members of society. And if giving them a sense of right. participation in the political process helps that, I'm not against it. But I do say, when I make the decisions along with colleagues about what we put in our manifesto for the next right. Parliament, of course I don't include each and every item for the last four years that's been passed by the Liberal Democrats, or we'd publish War and Peace. So I take the things that really matter, yes, but and that's not one of them. Uh, yeah, but it's still party policy. It's party policy, but it's not something we're putting forward in our manifesto uh, to promote in government in the well, next Well, what Parliament. you choose to tell the public is another matter, isn't it? No, it's not. Every party well, does this, Jeremy, for heaven's sake. Every party has reams of policy, reams of reactions to the right. issue of the day over the course of four years. You can't possibly, if you're sensible, consolidate that. And well, then you'd quite rightly ask me, well, given this uh, plethora of You would do it, then, wouldn't you? Our... No, we wouldn't. We're saying specifically... But you wouldn't do it. Not including it in this you, manifesto. So if we were in government, a, lib a liberal government would not give prisoners the right to vote. That is not something. Despite the fact it's party policy. Yes, we can't do. Isn't that precisely what we were talking policy. about earlier? No, we've got to make priorities of what we have from the the and wealth of accumulated decisions of the party, then put those priorities to the public. To the public. Yes, so that they know if they get us in government, what it is they get. You, and they can refer so to a manifesto which tells them. You'd like to do it, but you might not have time to get around to it. On top of everything else that's already in the manifesto, that's one of the reasons it's not in the manifesto. Uh, that presumably is also true of your policy to ban all animals except horses and dogs from circuses. This would be correct. Do you ever think you're slightly out of kilter with public opinion? No, I don't. I think one of the stories, if you like, of this parliament that's just come to an end and this election campaign now underway is the extent to which people have seen and are seeing the Liberal Democrats as actually being most in tune uh, with public priorities. And those public priorities have ranged on the international level and in the opposition in the war to Iraq to the domestic level, the priorities that we're putting in front of people. Identity cards? Well, look at Australia. In Australia, when it was first no, no, let's not look at Australia. No, let's let's look here. At Australia. All the evidence is... No, all the evidence is... I'm talking about public opinion here. Right. All the evidence here is that most people think it's either an acceptable idea or a good idea or a very good idea. Yep. And in Australia, and don't. when it was you rooted don't. in principle, we don't. In no, exactly. principle and in practice. 80% of people in Australia at the beginning of this debate thought, yes, 
and 20% were against. By the end of it, those positions had reversed. Why? People looked at the practicalities of identity cards, the costs to the individual involved, the curtailment of liberties and the sheer personal hassle involved in operating a scheme of and identity cards. When the most cards, senior policeman why. in Britain, Sir Ian mm -hmm. Blair, says he favours identity cards, he's wrong. You somehow know better, do you? Well, we are not persuaded. Now, Sir Ian has become persuaded. I think he also well, said in the course of that weekend the senior policeman in that Britain. he wasn't originally in favour. Uh, he's developed his view, and that's something that we have to take account of. But we have so a view you could develop your view to come round to well, it, presumably, no, could you? No, we're not uh, proposing to do that at all. We have said sure. that we're against You're identity cards. You're not capable of evolution cards. on this matter. We are, no, we have said that we are against... And yet he is a practising policeman. ...for civil libertarian grounds, identity cards, compulsory national identity cards, but also, and I've been asking the Prime Minister about this on many occasions over the course of the last six months or so, when you get into the detail of what it means for you and for me, having to go to a test centre, having to pay out a significant amount of money, problems for old people, the government not even being able to tell us, despite the fact they introduced a bill to this extent, how the system will work and exactly how much it will cost. I think it's a responsible opposition party that at that point says, hold on a minute, mm. this is not a route we should be going down. We'd be far better putting more police you, on the um, streets. You asked Sir Ian Blair why he's in favour of it. I have actually, uh, on a social occasion, uh, had exchanges with Sir Ian Blair about this, and also my colleague Mark Oaten, who speaks in Home Affairs with us, and he knows well where we're coming from. At the end of the day, the no, police... Have you asked him why he's in favour of it? No, I haven't asked him that direct question, because I haven't seen him since his should? weekend interview. Well, we're in the middle of an election campaign at the moment, and what I don't want to do is draw senior police figures any more into the politics of the election than some have been criticising them for being being already, although we right. haven't been among them. Let's look at another area. You're against detention without trial. You are, for the sake of argument, in Downing Street. The security services come to you and say, we believe a terrorist attack in this country is imminent. Mm -hmm. We do not have the evidence to charge or secure a conviction. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Well, we've been through the argument towards the end of this parliament. And the government were putting up precisely arguments like that to favour things like detention without trial. And as you well know, the House of Lords and a substantial view in the House of Commons wasn't going to have it because it was overturning an awful lot of our traditional liberties and ways of going about things. What they've now got at their disposal, and it's going to be reviewed... Now, what would you do in Downing Street? Well, what I would do, quite obviously, is look at the existing powers that are there and say, can such individuals, being such a major cause for concern, can they be brought in and questioned and can we go through it? What you can't do as a so politician... So you would say you can detain them without trial? No, I'm not saying detain them without trial, certainly not. But what I'm saying is... We've got to establish whether the evidence is there, and you can only do that properly if these people are apprehended under the existing provisions open to the police and the security services, and that's what should take place. But what I won't do... Then they'd be let free? What, no, that must be the decision for the judge sitting properly in a court to make that decision, not the decision for me as the politician. That's a very slippery slope to go down. You're absolutely confident that you could keep this country safe operating a policy like that? Yes, because I believe that we've been able to keep this country safe operating that approach as a policy for a very long time. And I believe that providing we maintain our institutions and our vigilance and provide the public keep the sense of proportion that they have through generations upon generations, we can continue in that fashion. You mentioned the Iraq war yeah. earlier. Massive demonstrations in this country, the biggest ones in the history of this country. Sure. Huge opposition to it, and you were the only big party that really took a stand against the war. People should be flocking to you in droves, and they're not, are they? Well, we didn't just do it for those reasons, that's the first thing. I didn't suggest. You know, we did it on grounds of principle. And secondly, people don't just make judgments in this or any other general election on one single issue, however big an issue it may be, there'll be a whole variety. But what you've seen, I think, over the last couple of years, largely as a result of our stance in Iraq, by no means exclusively, is a lot of people having a higher regard for the Liberal Democrats than perhaps they did before, and finding us attractive in many other ways. Now, we've got two and a half weeks of this campaign to go. We are at our highest ever standing that we've ever been as a party in a general election, and I think that the credibility of our stance in Iraq 
has been a big contributory factor to that. And an awful but, lot of people, as you know, have been filling the newspaper columns in recent weeks saying, for the first time ever, I'm going to vote Liberal Democrat. And one of the key reasons has been their stance and their continuing approach over Iraq. But isn't the difficulty that people don't see you as having the killer instinct? You mean me as a person or yes, Liberal Democrat? Yes, you personally. No, I don't think that's the case. I think that if you look at the achievements of the party over the last five years, it's not just down to me, but the leader must have something to do with it. It has been a, a story of steadily growing influence, importance, stature and credibility. And I think this campaign is a big, big opportunity to but make significant strides further forward. How that, far, I do not know. In that case, why didn't you capitalise more on the opposition to the war? Well, I think that we conducted ourselves constructively and in the way in which I like to conduct my politics, not just by name-calling, by making the rational case for opposition, and as we now are in this election, maintaining it by being the only one of the three parties saying, with the United Nations mandate expiring at the end of this calendar year, we should now be working and planning towards the phased withdrawal of the British troops as part of that occupying force and bringing our forces home. By when would you have them home? Well, we should be working to the UN expiry of the mandate, which is the end of this calendar year, obviously. By the end of 2005, you I, would have withdrawn all much, British troops. I very much hope so, yes. But you can't be certain, of course. Well, you can't obviously be certain about the development of the security situation in Iraq, but you can so, be certain that there's a UN mandate that you, runs out. And, and the, you would uh, withdraw the, them the, even if you were advised not to withdraw them, would you? Well, advised by whom? I think that... If the Iraqi the, government said, we need you here... Well... We are not bound by what the Iraqi government does. It would be ridiculous for us to say that we want uh, an Iraqi government taking more of its own responsibility so, for its country, having invaded that's it, a yes, Mr. And, Kennedy, then, isn't it? and then saying uh, that we're, we're going to uh, simply accede to anything they yeah. do when we ourselves are a sovereign country. That can't be right. I would like to see those troops home in line with the expiry of the UN mandate, and that's what we're arguing strongly as a party. So, incidentally, are people like Robin Cook and Douglas Hudd from other parties. On this question of your personal failure to capitalise on this widespread opposition to the war, do you think it is to some degree, because people look at you and they see an affable man, uh, but they see a man who, you know, who failed to turn up to the budget debate last year, who spoke openly about the need to change his lifestyle, and they don't feel entirely confident? No, I don't think so. I think that if you look at the, the measures of public opinion, about myself, about the party as a whole, they are positive. I think the biggest single question that I've always faced, that the party's always faced, is can these people win? And then if they win, can they deliver? Now, step by step, city by city, constituency by constituency, region by region, we're demonstrating that we can win. We're showing what Liberal Democrats are like when given authority, and people are approving of that. This election, this whole campaign, is about moving that on to a much higher level. And I think the conditions are there, and I think the party and myself are in good shape for that challenge. Have you uh, changed your lifestyle? I mean, is your doctor happy about how much you smoke and drink? Yes, my doctor is actually rather approving. He would like to see me not smoke at all, uh, but it has drastically come down since the turn of the year, and I'm determined that it's going to be phased out altogether, particularly with the arrival of the new one. You talk about the arrival of the new one. Uh, of course, it changes everybody's life. Sure. You must look at your life and you think you've been, what, 20 years at this game. You've never really done anything else. Tony Blair's decided he's not going to go on and on and on. Yeah. Are you? I hope so. That's my intention. I want to be in the next parliament leading a much, much bigger parliamentary party for the Liberal Democrats. I don't know how far our ambitions can go because we've got a very perverse voting system when it's three-party politics as it is in this election. But I think it can be substantially bigger. The opportunity in the next parliament is substantially greater. And when you've devoted your working life towards that objective, heavens above, you don't want to shirk off that opportunity. I'll be in there with enthusiasm, particularly as I do really genuinely feel, probably like every parent in history, that so, all the things I've argued for, I've now got this additional so still be... stake in the future that I didn't have until a week ago. So you expect to fight the next election too? Oh, I very much hope so, yes. That's my intention. Charles Kennedy, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Well, that's it from Liverpool. On Wednesday, I'll be talking to the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, but until then, good evening.
BBC Newsnight will air an interview with British Prime Minister Tony Blair on Wednesday and then Conservative Party leader Michael Howard on Friday.